Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. This is Megan from Casket Robbery, and we are so stoked to be returning to Milwaukee Metal Fest this year. You can catch us on Sunday, May 19th, along with Stabbing, Monochromatic Black, It Dies Today, Exhumed, Dead by Wednesday, Hate Creeper, Skeletal Remains, and so, so, so many more. So grab your tickets today and come hang out with us. We'll see you soon. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the show. We are back. We're getting we're finally getting on a somewhat regular schedule. And I, I thank you all for your patience and your understanding. As most of you have seen, uh, we're, we're getting the Anjasa for All record out and it's been eating up a lot of my time. We also have Milwaukee Metal Fest coming up, but the podcast has been rocking. You would have known if you were just subscribed to it at gasdigital.com or if you were on my Patreon, patreon.com slash Josta. But this was a big one. It's a long time in the uh, in the making and, in, and been in the works. And one of the things I noticed before I went on hiatus with the podcast was that a lot of people like to tell you who you can and can't talk to. And I'm, I'm just tired of that. I think uh, we should have the tough conversations and we should uh, engage with whoever we want to engage with especially if someone can get something out of it or if it points us in a new direction or, or gives us some sort of inspiration or motivation, or maybe it's just an interesting chat, which I think today's chat with Tim Lambesis is. And those of you who have been on my Patreon, you know that this has been something we've been talking about doing for a long time. We finally made it happen. I appreciate Tim doing this. And I just want to preface the episode by saying there was no edits um, he had no creative control over the episode. He didn't get to vet the questions. And I really appreciate that. A lot of times uh, with any guest, it, it could be someone with no controversy whatsoever. They will have a list of demands or a list of things we can't talk about. And that was not the case today. So props to Tim and his team. And this is just part one. So we're getting to the tough stuff in the beginning. I appreciate you guys understanding. So uh, just before you go leaving all the comments and emailing Joss the show at Gmail, just listen to the episode all the way through and uh, and let, let me know what you think. And then he will be back with Ken Susie for a part two, which we will get up very soon. But today's episode is brought to you by Century Media Records, the great and powerful Century Media Records, who are helping us present Milwaukee Metal Fest 2024. And we can't wait to have them there and have a bunch of their bands there. It is going to be awesome. Head on over to centurymedia.store after the podcast with Tim Lambesis today. Check out all the pre orders. You'll see they got uh, Psychotic Waltz, Double LP, Digipack. Uh, they got a ton of new releases like Bewitcher, who's on the fest, or maybe you're into black metal like Mayhem, or maybe you want the Angelus Apatrita record that I sang on. I mean, if I could be so bold as to plug a record that I was happy to guest on, that is all available over at centurymedia.store. And remember, Century Media will have a stage and they will have a bunch of their bands on their roster on the festival. Sunday is Sunday sales are really picking up. I know everybody's stoked on Avatar and Slaughter to Prevail, but don't sleep on Skeletal Remains. Don't sleep on Stabbing. Century Media has a ton of great artists that will be at Milwaukee Metal Fest. Get your tickets at therave.com slash Metal Fest. And we will be talking about possible suggestions, possible lineup additions for 2025 when you head on over to patreon.com slash Josta. We have some Milwaukee Metal Fest hopefuls for 2025 we're going to be listening to on the Weekly Metal Roundup. And if you want to go on the executive producer tier or all access tier, you can sit in live as we record these episodes like this one we did today with Tim Lambesis. While I have you, check out the Anjosta for All pre-orders. They are up now. Some of you already got the records. I appreciate that. Let me know what your favorite tracks are. Josta Show at Gmail. And if you want... Um, if there's any suggestions of other items you want in the pre-orders, hit us up and let us know. I see a lot of people asking about vinyl. The vinyl is up now at martyrstore.net. The code is JJ10, spelled out T-E-N, J-J-T-E-N. And you will save 10% at martyrstore.net. And you'll see we have Milwaukee Metal Fest meet and greets up there as well. Last but certainly not least, I want to thank Dunnable Guitars. Head on over to dunnableguitars.com today. And you will see all their awesome new models, pickups, um, all the different series. Ch I suggest checking out the uh, USA Standard Semi-Custom, depending on what your price range is. 
um, that that's the new series for 2024 and it's built in their USA custom shop. They make quality guitars and the price starts at 2650. A 50 percent deposit is required to confirm your build. I will be getting one and you should too. You can choose any model in its pre-configured specs that you can have your choice of dunnable pickups, finish color, hardware color, pickup, uh, pick guard material, and uh, soft or hard case. Got to go hard though. Dunnable, Dunnable Guitars, keeping it hard in 2024. Big thanks to Dunnable Guitars, another one of our sponsors for the Milwaukee Metal Fest. And uh, and yeah, that's it for now. If, of course, if I could be so bold, get your hate breed tickets. Boston selling well. New York selling really well. We're going back to Terminal 5, one of our biggest headline shows in New York in years. Um, L.A., Riverside, too. Both of those selling really good. All the VIPs are moving fast. Cleveland, New York, and um, Riverside VIPs are almost gone. Pittsburgh's catching up to martyrstore.net for the VIPs and hatebreed.com for your tickets. All right, we got Tim Lambesis from As I Lay Dying finally on the show after all these years. Let me know what you think after you've listened all the way through. Enjoy the show. My friend, the lead singer of Hate Breed, the infamous and notorious Jamie Jasta is in the building. That's what's up. Jamie Jasta from the metal band Hate Breed. That guy's famous. Coffee, death metal, and push-ups. That's Jamie Jasta. Remember Jamie Jasta? You know him. He's a podcaster, but he's also he's a metal man. I would say you need that. That shit is hard. <laughs> What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the show. It's a long time coming. We got Tim Lambesis finally joining us after many years of you guys breaking my balls <laughs> about having him on and giving him a chance. It's the time is here. Thanks for coming on, Tim. How's it going? Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I, I know I mentioned this before, but it's nice every once in a while to talk to somebody. You know, because I know like your audience and stuff, they've talked about me, but to talk to somebody and to talk about somebody, it's like two different things. And it's nice to just actually be here representing myself. Yeah. And I think, you know what, for those of you who are just tuning in, who are, who maybe don't know about this show and don't know the history of the show or don't know that, you know, I was one of, I don't know, maybe a handful of people that was like critical of you in, in the public on a, on a, at the time, what was a pretty big show, you know, I always, I had always said, well, I'm going to see him and I'm going to say the same thing to him, you know, in person. It's not like uh, I was never going to give you a chance to come on and, and defend yourself. But also it was like, you know, you can't tell me what I can say or how I can think or how I can feel. And, and a lot of your fans tried, believe me. I mean, they and they still do. Like if you come out with something new you know, they'll write me a whole manifesto and say, you know, come on, dude, what, you never wanted to kill your wife? Like, what, you think you're more morally superior than Tim? And it was never about that. Um, but I never I never wanted to kill my wife or, or anybody, you know, close to me. I just, it was, it just needed to be done at the right time. And um, under these conditions, which I have to commend you and, you know, your publicist for, and I really appreciate that, there was no contingencies. You know, it was like, come on and let's clear the air. Let's give the audience some context because it's it's not like these other podcasts. You you know, we've collaborated. You were on Headbangers Ball. I watched the ascent of the band and it was it was a win for everybody, you know, especially because the band had heavy parts and screaming vocals. So some some soft shit too, but well, yeah, yeah most people are surprised on the average when they they associate asley dying with um you know the earlier days of metalcore and you have bands it, it, to each their own of course and there's nothing wrong with going these different routes but you had bands like atreyu that took it very one, much one way and then you know other bands that stayed heavy and kind of repeated the same heavy formula from record to record and most people just associate us as somewhere on the singing side and they're kind of surprised when they actually hear how heavy our music is you know yeah and it was it was a big deal to be on mtv and to i get to you know host the show and really watch you and lamb of god and and kill switch and avenged and all these bands get pushed to the forefront and then we were always cool we played together 
tours, shows, you know, inside the country, outside the country. You sang on my record. I sing on your record. Um, so, you know, I want people to understand that it's not like I'm just some outsider um, thinking I'm holier than thou by condemning your actions. And I, I made I made that, you know, pretty specific, not so much condemning you as a person, but condemning your actions. But people will see and hear things, um, you know, how how they want to see and hear them. And I don't have control of that. Right. And I understand. I mean, I condemn my own actions. So it's like, well, I'm not in disagreement with you on um, just the just the tragedy of, of what I did and, and the ripple effect and layers of people that were hurt in the aftermath and how, you know, it's it's something that has to be talked about. I think my only condition I, I, I talked to our publicist about this is I'm, I'm an open book. I'm happy to talk about anything. I just don't want to continue to talk about things that have already been covered very very well in the past and my main reason for that is that we live in like such a clickbait society where i could do a 45 minute interview an hour-long interview and there could be one question it's about the same thing that's been talked about a thousand times and that somehow becomes the only headline again for the 100th time and just for my career it's like well i'm i'm not even like hiding from it i'm just not interested to like be stuck in the same storyline over and over again you know i know i i just feel like because you're out here getting to promote music and you're getting to sit, tell your side of the story it regardless if you like it or not it brings up the question of you know where where are your kids where is your ex do or do you have a do you have a restraining order still do you do you have contact with them do you pay alimony you know that's that people want to know that stuff yeah, and I think those are like fair questions, but also one of the reasons I'm an open book and I'm happy to talk about anything, but if somebody has asked me and if somebody has to just specifically not address them publicly, not talk about them publicly, not bring in any of what's going on in their life, where they've been, no updates, and to just really be removed from the situation out of respect for that person in that family, I, I want to I wanna do that. So like... I don't want you to think that if I'm not answering a question of yours, it's because I'm trying to be problematic or difficult. It's just that I want to do what I believe uh, is the right thing in the aftermath of the the horrible things I've done in my past. No, I get it. Um, But are like, are they in witness protection? Is no, uh, I mean, for one, I'm, I I have agreed to not speak about them. So like, I just want to make that very, very clear. Um, But for two, I mean, even, you know, even two days after the event, there was never like the the idea of there being like a true real threat and then a threat that was created by a government official. Those are two very different things. Right. So um, and I'm not saying that that makes my heart not guilty or anything like that. I'm addressing that I still said what I said. I still did what I did. It doesn't make me any less guilty as a person. But in terms of the actual threats that are prevalent in society, I mean, there's there was zero and there is zero still. Okay. And when, you know, you're doing these other shows, right? Like say Garza and shout out to Garza. I I did watch and listen to that. And I, I love Garza and I love his podcast. These things, as far as I remember, they weren't brought up. So, yeah. And, and so in in all fairness to Garza, um, he really wanted to just tackle anything. You know, he also has people on his channel that are saying, Hey, you should ask him about this. And I did tell him ahead of time. I said, you know, I, um, I can speak as openly as, as you want me to, but if there's a question that I've like, you know, I promised a person like, Hey, I won't bring them into the media again, ever again. You know, like I, I just want to make sure that that part is, is clear, you know, cause I, I do, I do want to stand by what I agreed to. And is that like a legal agreement or is it just, uh, it's both. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it originates, um, as a principle and then, uh, you know, I've, I've signed documents to make sure that that's clear. And then th- there's been requests in the aftermath of that as well, that I, I want to make sure that I'm an, I'm not just like trying to follow very technically to the letter of the law. And I can like, so, oh, I can like tell the story like about this guy who's ob- very obviously me. And then I'm just going to go ahead and tell the story. Right. Like, I think th- even these workarounds and these weird manipulative ways to do it, I think are just not, not the right thing for me. Um, and I, just, I don't think the right, the right thing for healing because healing to me is what, the primary uh, goal with all this is okay so there is like a plan to then maybe 
see them or get back in their life later on when when they're adults? I, I don't know how many different ways I can say that I, I've just chosen to not speak about anything that's going on with, with them publicly out of their request. And so if that were the case, as an example, I wouldn't even want to be able to like announce that to the world. Okay. I, I'm in a weird position because like I'm damned if I do, I'm damned if I don't. Like I'm already... I totally get it. Yeah. I, I mean, the amount of hurt that I caused, I, I know that it's very reasonable for people to not want to be a part of my life. And it's very reasonable for me to have to respect lines that have been drawn to say that, you know, let's just move forward and try to heal and be healthy without having to figure out how to like rehash this and talk about it and reintroduce, you know, each other. So I think that's a reasonable point of view. Should anybody ever have that? Um, and it would be incredibly um beyond what i deserve if i ever had the chance to to interact with you know people that i've heard again and and that's all i can really say about it okay fair enough um you know going into this i did go back and search like some of our i mean even go i was surprised i even had them in the in the laptop still but like some of our back and forth um leading up to you know collaborating and things like that and when i had searched your name especially in the fan mail you know like for the podcast because it all's aggregated into one box you know going through it for me it was disappointing it was like i really felt like people sided with you based off of the things that i had said publicly and it it not only made me kind of rethink how I interact with fans, but it made me think, man, there's a lot of people that want to hurt their spouses or, or do terrible things. And I don't want to put these people on blast, but it was like, do I want this person as a fan? Do I want to um, engage with these people? And I tried to always respond politely, but I noticed that some of their anger right was directed towards me because they felt like i was unforgiving or i was closed-minded and it was something i had to really grapple with because it was a good amount of volume of, of people and i'm from a band that you know half of our fan mail was from prison and i genuinely wanted these people you know who would write me to not only have forgiveness, but eventually get out, get their lives together. So that's part of why I'm having you on the show is to is to tell you my experience and give you an understanding of like my relationship to what happened and the mistake you made, and also what I learned from it and and how I viewed the world. Now I'm not so um, in the weeds anymore, right? Because it's been years. We've seen each other multiple times. Be you know since you've gotten out and i do feel like you're on the right path but are you on the right path i guess that's the question i i'm trying to get to here and and what do you say to those people who you know are are possibly out there thinking about hurting their spouses yeah well i mean one for for you that's a very unfair because you're in a difficult situation where it's like you want to talk about something you're not even sure at any moment along the process exactly how you concretely feel forever and you're just sort of processing something that affected our whole scene so to speak you know uh, uh, that word has changed in meaning over the years but like our, our scene has been affected by what i've done because of the association it's like you know then you get the the face of metal as a as a whole is a little bit darker looking because i'm associated you know what whether um people like our band or not we're still one of the largest metal bands in the world and so it it, it paints a whole picture you know uh, of of what metal is like to, in some people's minds so that affects you and, and i i sympathize with that and i think that as it relates to those fans that are really have these angry feelings i think whenever somebody's like really up, upset or feeling a certain way like they're invalidated by their spouse on a regular basis or just really kind of like relatively small things in the big scheme of it there's something that happens along the way and, and it makes them feel like it's an outlet for all these feelings that they've not been able to properly address and talk to. And those things actually need to go to, you know, really good friends and family and therapists and things like that. But, you know, in the moment of just visceral emotion, they're just like, Oh, I felt that way before. I know exactly what you're talking about. And 
you know, I remember growing up playing sports and stuff and getting mad at like people I was playing sports against as a, as a kid and be like, Oh, I hate you. You know? And then like, you know, two hours later, we're like, you know, eating dinner together. Right. You know what I mean? Because like, I've gone through different emotions. I think do people, people do as a whole and they let them out online. And I can just say to any of those people feeling that, I mean, yes, like maybe, maybe you feel like you're losing uh, custody of your children, or maybe you feel like, you know, you're being blocked from being able to, to interact in the lives of those people that you love close to you. But you may feel for a moment like, oh, I wish I could hurt somebody or my hurt. I, f- I have so much hurt that I'll do anything in the world to get rid of my own hurt, even if that means hurting somebody else. And you may feel that way for a second, but I know that you're going to regret it if, if you do anything other than feel that for a moment and just accept that thought in that moment. It's okay to feel that way for a moment, let it go and, and keep it in context. Yeah, and a lot of times I would ask the question back to them. You know, if especially if it was someone who really took the time and wrote me this whole manifesto of like, you know, you need to be more accepting and you need to be, and, and I'm not the one who was, was in a, a Christian band or, um, and, and maybe that's why some people took it harder, right? Because of the hypocrisy surrounding the band and. Yeah, there's a lot of layers to it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I would ask these people who would write me because it did come up on multiple shows where we where we spoke about you and your situation. I would ask them like, how would you, I would ask them the same thing. I'm going to ask you, like, how would you feel if you were estranged from your father and you come to find out that you don't, you're not talking to him, you're not seeing him because he tried to kill your mom. You try to have someone kill your mom or, or try to hire someone. I mean, and, and then I would get a much different response. It's easy because you're in the public eye and you were the soundtrack for something that helped them. So in a way they want to defend you because you represent a period of their life where your music was their soundtrack to getting over something. But that was the point of us doing this music. It was like, so we don't dive in that into that dark, dark river and make that type of mistake. Yeah. I I mean, for me, I, I have to prove over time that that's an isolated, terrible thing in my life that I, you know, that not only did I have a level of um, hurt within myself that I felt like I, I was so selfishly focused on that I was willing to hurt another person to rid of that hurt, but that I was susceptible to the idea that somebody said, hey, dude, I got an idea. This is what I think, this is what I think will solve your problem. And the, the fact that I was just like, okay, cool, that'll solve my problem. Who cares about the repercussions, right? That's an insane place in life to be. Um, and I think one of the things that's confusing about that situation largely is that does that negate every other good thing I've ever done in my life? You know, like the, there, I, I know I was specifically confusing people that I had re- like really helped get on their feet after tough situations. You know, they were just like, man, this dude like really sacrificed his own time and money to help me behind the camera. Nobody ever saw about it, nobody ever knew about it. And this dude is like one of the main reasons in my life that I've been able to like get on my feet. But at the same time, this dude did this terrible thing. It's like that's I'm putting people in a weird, confusing situation. And, and I can say that as a window into humanity as a whole, um, we as a society kind of paint this like this guy's good and like like I can get behind him or this dude's done something wrong and screw this guy and everything he's ever done. And I think that's a really weird thing. I mean, if you look at like world heroes, I mean, I don't know if you consider this guy a hero. I, I don't, but like like Winston Churchill is an example. A terrible individual, like just just documented, like hundreds of pages worth of just terrible things he's done in his lifetime. But in important good moments, like he you know, helped overthrow Hitler, right? So we remember him as this like war hero, this great, amazing guy. But if you look at the literature of his life, actually, on average, he was a pretty terrible guy, you know, and and then on the flip side, you have a guy, and I'm not saying that I'm the opposite, I'm just a very clear example in the situation, somebody who's done good most of his life, and who just really, really went down a dark place, and condemns his own actions at this point, and even people defending me, like I, I can't defend the people defending me. Like I don't, you know, I think the easiest way to go forward in my life is to say that was, I mean, I'm not going to plead insanity because I, you know, I, I went to prison. I served regular time in a regular general population yard, but like that's some insane thinking. And I just, I like can't even relate to that person at this point in my life. And so I don't, I don't know how to defend that person. I don't have a desire to defend that person. Yeah. And, and the things that I would write, you know, even now they seem kind of like dated. They seem 
because we've seen each other, we've talked face to face. And I would say like, when the time is right, he'll come on. I'm not blocking you. I'm not trying to hurt his career. I'm not trying to do any, I'm not actively out here. Yeah, uh, never felt that way. And, and I don't know how you felt about our interactions, but um, they were civil. I said what I had to say. Um, I don't know what you remember from each, but I, I'm pretty sure. Our, well, actually, let's back it up a little bit because I do remember seeing you two times where I knew something was wrong and I knew I knew something was up because you went from this. Um, and again, when I say this stuff, I'm not coming from a place of moral superiority. No, you're telling ac accurate history. I'll, I'll and, tell you if you're inaccurate. I, I know. I know the dark path, you know. It was it was it was strange because you went from being this guy of like, you know, look at look at my beautiful family. You know, we adopt these kids to 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 drinking and now there's like strippers with fake tits backstage and I'm you're hanging out with dudes. I'm like, whoa. And I'm thinking, well, OK, um, that's it's not ideal, but never did I think it would go to that place, even though I've seen many people go to that place. I mean. I guess I wasn't as critical of some of those people um, who've gone through with it even or, or worse. Um, but it's not because I give one person a pass and the other one I don't. It just literally was these weren't famous people. These weren't people that and, or if I was in a band with them or if I had, you know, interaction was with them, it was years prior. Whereas we were, you know, had just collaborated, just done gigs together, and it was a shock. And then I'm also doing this podcast and I'm also, yeah. you know, being inundated with these things. And even now, you know, I, I, who knows? I, I might do an intro before this saying like, look, if you've been in a, a, an abusive relationship, there's going to be some triggering things during this episode. I, I'm still you know, working through what I feel is like valuable for people to hear about and talk about. And I agree with you. you you're you're in, in that sense. The good things that you're currently doing, the good things that you've done um, since then should should be commended. Everybody should have a road back to a certain extent. Um, but I, I think my question would be, you know, to to those people who are still out there, like struggling with this, is that every such. Well, let me, let me back it up. One other thing, too, before I lose my train of thought here, um, every situation is different. And just because someone did more time for a lesser crime or someone did um, something way worse and, you know, is in a band, the two don't have anything to do with each other. Like people, people think, oh, there's people do, you know, doing time for weed and you get out in two years. That's not up to us. You can have that opinion, but that's not up to, to you or I, right? Yeah. That was up yeah. to you. All I could do is serve the time that was given to me, you know, and it's, and the time is also massively miscalculated. It was, it's like five years that I served in terms of actual serve time. We'll get into that later. Though. I don't want to, I don't interrupt your thought. Right. Right. And so if I had said something and then they say, well, he served his time, you know, I, I'm allowed to think it wasn't enough time, especially in comparison to other people I know who have done time. And did. Yeah, it depends if your, if your goal is rehabilitation or punishment. I mean, if, from the standpoint of punishment, it's a very arbitrary number. You know, what makes another person feel good to like, how long should I be punished for another person to feel that sense of retribution or whatever, whatever you'd call it. That's, not a, a question I'm like even going to attempt to answer, but in terms of like rehabilitative statistics and like what actually works for rehabilitating a human being, did I serve enough time? Like, absolutely. You know, uh, could I have served less time from a rehabilitative standpoint? Technically speaking, yes. I'm not saying that I, I should have. All I can really do is serve the time that was given to me and be as re rehabilitative minded about it as possible because I'm going to be somebody's neighbor at some point. And am I an asset as their neighbor or am I just like, oh man, I can't believe this psycho lives next door to me, you know? And so, um that's really that's really my responsibility and and that's 
you know, kind of my justification of having you on as well. It goes in. That's this part of the thinking is like, look, you're helping people with addiction counseling. You're you're doing your best to be on the straight and narrow, you know, for for any of these times that I've written these people back, whether they were for or against you. Nothing is good enough. Right. So and that's a deeper conversation for a later time. But in regards to us sitting down and having a chat on the podcast and trying to provide people something of value. I just think that the conversation should be had when it comes to, um, you know, not only doing something good with your time post getting out of, of, of jail or prison, but staying away from the dark river, as I call it, which is easy to jump back into. And I know everybody's going to say, well, he's, I know I'm going to get these emails and, you know, well, he's still on hormone therapy and, and that contributes, you know, look at Vince McMahon. W what do you have to say about that? And do you, do you feel like that is being on, um, hormone therapy, you know, could be a, a danger. Everybody's got to weigh, weigh their options of like where they're at. So, so say you go to the doctor and you get a new blood test every three to six months for two and a half years and you're, you've destroyed your, testosterone levels uh they're not bouncing back if anything every time they have a semblance of bouncing back you look at the long-term just statistic and it's actually declining and getting and getting even worse um and the psychological problems that come along with that the depression um the anxiety just the, the physical feelings of um you know just like actually just struggling with day-to-day -day life and that doesn't matter how big your frame is as a person that's just internally what's happening inside your body and all the studies will show that a person is mentally healthiest when they have a uh, a healthy level of testosterone. I'm not talking about like getting a test and your testosterone's at 2,000 or something like a bodybuilder. I'm talking about just like a steady. The body, the body wants to be in a state of homeostasis and like have consistency, you know. And so it's like I'm I'm having a level of testosterone in my body because of the damage that I've done. That's just consistent, and it's from that consistency that I'm able to, you know, look the same. One one of the biggest proofs from my standpoint that, you know, that I'm pursuing this in a healthy fashion is because if you were to look at uh, the damage I caused to my body and, and what's necessary for me to just be a general healthy person, it's not like when I found a healthy solution that I like, you know, all of a sudden I became this giant muscle bound dude. I've been the, I've had the exact same physique for probably like, you know, 12 years now, you know, other than from nutritional issues, you know, like obviously when you're incarcerated, um, on a side topic, people incarcerated in the state of California, you cannot survive like from a state diet. You have to have a side hustle. And so if you have family to support you, that's great. They can send you little packets of tuna or whatever else. But like you, you cannot live and, and be healthy on the state diet. So you have to like hustle like crazy just to, just to like not be, you know, frustrated and, and hunger all the time. Um, with that said, even, no matter what I did, I, I, you know, I was down probably 20 pounds lighter than I am now because of that. But if you just look at my life over the period of uh, like a 12 year period, I mean, I haven't had any fluctuations and that's because I'm on this like healthy path of just consistency. And, and by the way, like I'm not saying that, uh, that I'm a perfect human being and that like all along the last 12 years, you know, that ever since I was incarcerated, I've never made a mistake in my life. You know, I, I have all kinds of shortcomings still as a human being, but, uh, but the general thing that I'm pursuing at this point, especially I was just being healthy. Well, yeah. And anybody that brought that up and, and the reason why I keep bringing up, you know, the community as a whole, like of people who correspond with the show is because, you know, we're, we're not in your life every day. We're, we're not. And again, it goes back to the judging. It's like if you were out here totally ripped and greased up and tan looking like you were going to a, a, a bodybuilding show, I might be like, yeah, maybe I don't want to talk to him just yet. You know, maybe or, or at least not on the show. Um, but just whatever from the from the outside looking in it didn't look like you were abusing steroids and um and and on a bad path but i mean there's times because i have a a real case genuine case of body dysmorphia where i'll think to myself man i've been at a plateau for like a decade i haven't really like done anything because you, you can have a certain amount of growth from consistency and and so i think for me just to address really quickly as a 250 pound man the reason i'm, I'm able to be a 250 pound man is you know, a lot of those COVID years in particular, I wasn't on the road. I just got to control my eating. I got to control, you know, how often I went to the gym and however long I wanted to work out. And it was like, 
a lot of downtime, as you know, you know, like if you wanted to just focus on something and get good at it, you had time to do that. And so any, um, you know, progress that I've made, I, I feel like has been rooted in consistency, but because of my body dysmorphia, there's times when I think to myself like, Oh man, like I, I wish that, that I was one of those, those, psychological types that's not so affected by trend and i could just run a trend cycle and like you know just become like finally be like a big person because in my mind i'm not a big person it's weird you know um my wife asked me she said uh you know what do you think is like the size difference between us in your head and i said well in my head we're like the same size and and i wasn't kidding you know and she's like do you ever like think that that's weird and i say i only think it's weird when i see a picture of us and then I realized how absurd that is that I feel that way. But in day-to-day -day life, I can't uh, shake that feeling for some reason. So, and it's so a psychological disorder, you know? Quick interruption. Letting you know today's episode is brought to you by Dunnable Guitars, one of our awesome, amazing sponsors for Milwaukee Metal Fest. And right now, you can head on over to DunnableGuitars.com and check out the USA Standard Series, which is new for 2024. They will build in their USA custom shop a badass axe for you and or yours and it features their core models with semi-custom menu of options like donable pickups finish color hardware color pick guard material soft or hard case whatever you want donable got you dog price starts at 26.50 50 percent deposit is required to confirm your build feel free to reach out to them at contact at donable with any questions prior to placing your deposit but you'll see when we got that new studio, we're going to have that Dunnable guitar in there, and I will be using Dunnable on the next release. I think it's going to be the Josta for the core EP, which if you want to support, head on over to the patreon.com slash Josta. I'll tell you more about that EP. Who knows? Maybe we'll get it out by Christmas, depending on when Dunnable gets me this badass axe. But you'll see over there at DunnableGuitars.com. Uh, we want to support them because they support Milwaukee Metal Fest and the Josta Show. Big thanks to DunnableGuitars.com. While I have you, check out MartyrStore.net. This is the reason why we haven't had that many podcasts on a consistent schedule. We have been not only planning Milwaukee Metal Fest 2024, but I got the And Josta for All record coming out May 17th, digital and streaming. Some of you have already got your physical copies, and you can still pre-order now at martyrstore.net use the code jj10 that's jjten martyrstore.net it's got steve from exodus chuck from testament scott ian from anthrax phil demo ton of great guests and josta for all is the name of the album go check it out at martyrstore.net use the code jj10 so how do you keep from that developing into something down the road uh, especially now when you're seeing like it's such a, a hot topic with what uh, hap just happened with Vince McMahon. I mean, don't you worry about the dependency on that stuff long term? I I'm actually so out of the loop. I don't know what 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 happened with Vince McMahon. Can you just give me a quick like short version of it? Yeah, he, he 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 went full trend brain, and I've read stuff about trend in the in the past, like where it it really deviates. I don't know what it is if it's, if it's your frontal lobe or your process of just impulse behavior, um, or or sexuality right because it, it does have an effect on the sex hormones it's not like just straight trt if you if you're stacking it with other hormones um i guess it desensitizes you over time so that things become sexually more freaky i, I don't want to like misrepresent it but yeah, no, I, I mean i did trend back in the day i i didn't notice the psychological effects until i came off of it and i was like what what was i thinking what was i doing you know i, I would be talk you know oh man i really this could come across wrong but i was talking you know talking to women that i it would never in a million years think to be talking to because i just like wanted constant female interaction and just uh you know there's there's a huge level of irrationality and also no disrespect to these women uh you know so that's kind of a, a weird topic to get into but yeah there's there's a lot of irrational thoughts that come in and and certain percentages of the population are drastically more affected by it. So I ended up having like a really long conversation with um, the world's like leading expert in this as a researcher uh, at, at Harvard. And he like leads the department and does, you know, actively researches, um, you know, anabolics on, on a regular basis and their effect on, on people psychologically. And he said that uh, conservatively 10% of the population has a drastic, drastic effect 
And then the other 90% has some type of effect, just not nearly as drastic as that 10%. And he said, um, you know, this is, this is years ago that we were talking. This is actually while I was on house arrest. Uh, and he said, but just for your, he's like, this, none of this is really going to change your, you know, your life right now, but, but just for your overall outlook on life, just remember that you're one of those people that is clearly in like that 10%, like you might even be in the like lowest 4% of the people that almost get into like a state of psychosis from it. And the reason it's so confusing is because you'll meet another gym bro at the gym who's, you know, been running like a 16 week trend cycle and he's totally fine. You know, he goes home and he's a great father and he, you know, works his desk job and he has no problems, no outbursts, no nothing. And, and that's why it's, I think, so confusing and uh, such a hot topic in the bodybuilding community alone, especially when it gets out of that community, then it gets even more misunderstood because people think like, oh, well, I know people that have taken trend, they're totally normal. So this guy's just, this guy's just full of it. You know, this guy's just like insane, like for trying to blame something. And I, by the way, like I, on one other topic, the whole, the whole emphasis of the anabolics to me um, is something that a lawyer is supposed to do, right? It's like, like as a client, I would go into court and I wouldn't know what my lawyer was going to say. I genuinely wouldn't, especially when I was still incarcerated and I had very uh, minimal access to my attorney. He would just go into the courtroom and just like, this is what I believe is in the best interest of my client. And I didn't get to speak once until my sentencing. The one and only time that I spoke at my sentencing, I, I just, you know, it, it was, I was like, I, I can't remember at what point I started crying, but it was, it was like this, apology that was impossible for me to put into words and I just struggled to get it out. That's all I had to say. Well, it, it's a hot topic because there's young people that want to achieve this impossible standard and they're wrecking their bodies because they see these guys on Instagram and they see these guys talking about eat fucking, you know, bull testicles <laughs> and deer me and you're going to look like this and it's all a lie. And it's disheartening for young kids. Um, so I appreciate you being candid about it, but then there's the real, real dark side, which is, and I don't know how much of it, you know, led to your situation, but you know, you, you are an example that comes up, but the, you know, now with Vince McMahon in the, in the limelight for doing very fucked up sexual shit and more people coming out with accusations of rape and, and forced, uh, you know, misconduct and, and, and forced, um, I, I don't even know if allegedly it's all allegedly but it's um these are credible things he might he might end up doing time um so and that's a whole heartbreaking topic in and of itself because i like don't even know how to emotionally process some of those um sex related crimes because i whether i wanted to be or not for two years and nine and a half months i lived in an environment where if I didn't stab somebody like that, if they walked past me in the hallway, I would get stabbed for not stabbing them. And granted, I didn't have to stab anybody because I wasn't housed with sexual related crimes, but um, that's just a, the sexual related crimes are th something that causes a vis visceral reaction, even amongst inmates, it causes this reaction of like, people don't know how to handle it emotionally. So I, I don't know, I don't even really know how to talk about that, to be honest. Well, if you're doing it safely currently and people see this and they want to know, you know, if they are in this, whatever you said, four to 10 percent who who could be driven to psychosis from some of these hormones or some of these substances, my advice would be like, don't fucking do it. I don't care how old you are. Well, yeah, and I, I want to clarify, like, I, I'm not by any means running like uh, a cycle or um, running some sort of like borderline substance that that could potentially put me even even like even has a 1% chance of putting me into like a weird mental state. I'm actually doing the opposite. I have destroyed many of my hormones over the years from, you know, cycles that I, I didn't know what I was doing. I just kind of I'm like one of those dudes that, that I have a little bit of like risk seeking behavior as my just baseline biology you know and so i just like when it came to like doing steroids it's just like hey i'm just gonna go for it and like i was like oh, I'll, I'll figure it all across the bridge when i get there and i just went for it didn't 
really go on or off, didn't understand what post cycle therapy was and all these things, you know, it's just like before people just openly had YouTube tutorials on this kind of stuff, you know, so I, I would even say this, if somebody's going to go out and do stupid stuff, at very least watch a YouTube tutorial from some dude, like the more plates, more dates guy or something like that, that's going to like break down, you know, the it, it, a safer way to do it. But with that said, I'm, I'm actually just restoring um, to like my, my normal non- non-cycled levels I'm, I'm trying to just basically be exactly where my doctor wants me to be and i get regular blood tests so that i'm i'm following that that plan and i'm if, if anything if i'm too low i'm gonna have psychological you know depression related symptoms and if i'm too high you know i'm gonna be um i'm, I'm gonna be physically putting my life a little bit unhealthy but m mostly for the most part is you're not gonna like this is a little bit nerdy but like if you're running you know a regular TRT dose, just a, a healthy replacement of your testosterone because you've hurt your, you've, you've destroyed your endocrine system over time. And you're running that versus running, let's just say 300 milligrams of testosterone a week, which is definitely not uh, a TRT level. It's like outside of that. It's like in the very low end of like the bodybuilding level of like running testosterone. There's really no, no significant jump there. It's not till you get like above you know, like 500 milligrams a week. And so I'm so far beyond or so far away from uh, below with the 500 milligrams a week or even the 300 milligrams a week would be, those are like the thresholds that people generally say that's like a cycle level, right? And so I'm so far away from those that um, if, if there was ever to be a, a problem with my like daily regimen, it would be that I like, oh, I forgot to take my, you know, my medicine this week and my levels crashed. And now I'm like kind of, you know, a little bit depressed and moody and you know, uh, I, I mean, what I, I hate to like say this, but if, if you're having low testosterone makes you moody, which is like where the stereotype of in, in a woman's cycle of like when the estrogens move like past a certain level, like there is a, a known, this isn't like, you know, controversial. There's a known level at which like you become moody as a human being. Right. So I think that's, well, that would be my greatest danger if I just was, you know, missing my medicine essentially. Well, you don't, but you're not at a level where, you're going to have a temper or act no, no. in a way where um, it could become an issue again. No, and, and I'm a human being. So, I mean, I naturally get upset about things sometimes. You know what I mean? If somebody cuts me off and I'm already late and I'm already stressed about 10 other things and I, you know, yell and honk or whatever, I'm, I'm a human, you know, and then I let it go 20 seconds later and I realize I'm actually laughing at myself, you know, but. So I'm not going to say that I've never had an emotional feeling or even a slight outburst. Um, but I do also want to clarify that the um, the headspace that I was in when I felt this internal pain of like what it feels like to be losing your children as a father, it doesn't actually create like this this anger that just, that just like, you're just running around everywhere. Like, do you just want to yell at everything? Like, I, I think that believe it or not would have probably been like healthier because I could have just vented and got it all out. And I would have had friends that would have been like, dude, like that sucks. And I, I hate that you feel that way as a father and stuff like that. Like that would have been probably a healthier way for me to be venting, but to be really depressed and to be in this situation where I feel like I'm, in this corner, just like no way out of this room. And the only way out of this room is to either continue to hurt myself or to hurt somebody else. I'm like, it's this desperation that I was feeling. And it's, it's that desperate mindset that leads people to the worst of worst crimes. I don't think that even, even when it comes to sentencing guidelines, I think if a judge were to see somebody who just got really angry in, in the middle of a bar, because some guy like spit in his face, he's going to get a whole lot of a less sentence than a dude who's like, feeling desperate and and just starts you know with unprovoked like assaulting people right you know what i mean those are very different crimes and um i'm not saying any of this to justify any of my action i'm just I'm trying to in, insight to the mindset that was unhealthy at that time and um i don't feel backed into a corner like that in terms of i i can only hurt myself or hurt somebody else like those are the only options i have i don't feel like that anymore and that's um that's i think where the insanity came from for me yeah and I'm still in the same position, you know, like, and, and that's why if people hear this or see this, the stance is still the same. Like, I get it. People are drawn to do bad things They're they're pushed, whatever the case may be. You don't get to play God. That was always my, that was always yeah. my stance. And 
in your in your situation if someone would come at me really hard like you you got to forgive you got to forget you got to move on you know why you're still talking about it which it wasn't a lot it was it was very it was very few and far between but it was something that when it was brought up it would people were they had a reaction i mean i would get emails within 10 minutes of the episode being released and it's you know it, it is what it is I can't change another person's behavior, but you're not going to tell me I'm crazy or I'm a bad person because I think you can't do that and you shouldn't do that. There's a moral imperative. You yeah. can, and it's a scale. Like I'm not saying I've never cheated. I never thought about killing somebody. I never I'm not saying that. I'm just saying as a public figure and someone who supported the band and really, you know, enjoyed watching you guys win. And real, I mean, that your guys in your band, those guys were like universally liked guys that people, I mean, they really loved these guys. It wasn't, it, you don't see that a lot. It was lightning in a bottle. So it made it extra hard to, to think, wow, not only did you try to play God, but you did it in this cowardly way where, you know, you're going to have someone else do your dirty work. And then to have fans tell me I'm crazy. I'm the bad person. I'm, you know, not being forgiven. I was like, yo, we're living in the fucking upside down. But it, it gave me at least enough, um, I guess, sense of, of, you know, looking inward or, or, or something to think about where I could just go, yeah, think about this next time you're, you're drawn to drink or drawn to do drugs or drawn to anger or drawn, drawn to a conflict, you know, think about the consequences. And I hope people will listen to this and, and do the same and, and not think it's okay. Regardless if you're religious or not, there is, I do believe there is a moral imperative and I do believe in, in, in good and evil. Um, but you know, I looked you in the eyes in Germany. I looked you in the eyes in California, wherever I saw you last. And um, you can now the fans can hear this and listen to this. If they haven't seen you on Garza or haven't seen you on the other one, um, I forget what it was called, but it was it was a good chat with the therapist guy. You know, they can listen to this. Do, you know, are you evil? Do you feel evil? Do you feel the tendency to do evil? No, I, I don't. And, and of course, I think one of the things about saying something like that is just I have to understand that time proves that more than anything, you know, because what is anybody in my situation going to say, unless they're like, you know, black metal roots, like level of evil, like they're, they're going to say like, of course I'm not evil. Right. So uh, I'm not even asking somebody to like, take my word for it. I'm just asking people to let life unfold. Um, if it's an isolated thing in my life, if it's a terrible, terrible isolated thing that will never be, uh, revisited in any way in my life, then, you know, th then we'll, we'll know that. And, and I don't know, I, I think the idea of like trying to live my life in a way of what redemption is supposed to look like for other people has also caused problems of its own, you know, like, um, you know, I remember getting out and sitting down and having coffee with a, a particular, uh, fr friend, I guess, or ex colleague or whatever. And, you know, just sort of getting the sense that, okay, he really feels like redemption should look, look a certain way. And he sort of has this like belief in his head of like how it should look. And he's asking me to like check in with him before I like do anything public so that like the redemption looks the way he wants it to look. And I remember just thinking to myself, like, man, like this is really unhealthy for my relationship with this person. And also just for the way I'm living my life, because if, if I don't prove redemption quick enough for somebody or, or if it just looks like, man, like Tim's still a human. See, look at that. He, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know like what the criticisms are, but I just can't make my redemption look like what other people want it to look like. I just got to live it daily. And, and I'm confident over a period of many, many years, like even the people that are criticizing what the path to redemption looks like right now will eventually be like, okay, you know what? That guy, that guy wasn't full of it. So. Yeah. And, and, and that's how I look at the podcast. Like, I'm going to fuck up. I'm going to say shit that I regret or that I didn't mean or that I said on, on a, 
on a one little, you know, end of an episode that someone will take and they'll be like, I, bri- I broke all your fucking CDs because you said this one passing little thing. But I consider the criticism when it's constructive, or at least I try to so that I can learn and grow and not be a stick in the mud. And that's, you know, been the, my whole thinking about whether or not to have you on all, you know, all throughout this time. And I know I'm still going to get the people, why are you platforming this guy, blah, 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 blah. But you're out here, you're making music, you're, 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 you're jamming with uh, colleagues of mine that I've known and played many shows and many tours with. Um, it's not, it's not the same. People got to accept that. Um, I wish it could be, but what is, what is your current relationship with uh, Jordan and Nick and, and do you see a road back with them? Uh, I would never like close a door on anything like permanently because I think like concepts like always and never are very immature concepts. Um, but um, I can just speak for, like matter of factly that I think that sometimes when you've created enough hurt, so like the very thought of me or sight of me to some people is a traumatic trigger and brings a high, high level of emotion to the surface. Uh, and I could say specifically as it relates to Nick, I don't know where he's at now in his life, but I, I do know that that in our interactions, there was just constantly a heightened level of, of emotion. I mean, I could be trying to do the simplest thing in the world, you know, like, uh, Hey, I, um, I'm sending these files around to the guys in the band because I rearranged the song. and I think this arrangement might be the better arrangement, right? And it's like, instead of advocating for the song, all of a sudden now we're talking about, well, you know, does Tim have the right to be doing whatever he wants with the song? And like, is he trying to call the shots again? And, you know, and like, I'm not saying that he was even giving me a hard time, but I'm just saying as an example, all of a sudden this weird overthinking comes into everything because it's like, does this person have nefarious intentions in every single thing that he does, you know? And, uh, and then I still have shortcomings as a human being. So then sometimes, you know, he's looking at me like, see, dude, like you still screw up, you know, like you're, you're frustrating me. And there's no, I'm not pointing the finger. I'm just saying the, the level of heightened emotions there just made an environment to where even our, you know, band therapist was like, this is for the best, you know, um, collectively. And that's when, you know, everybody else was still in the band um, and he wasn't choosing sides. He just was saying, guys like sometimes this is just what you have to accept like this you know somebody's creating a situation where everybody constantly feels like emotionally sort of like pushed into whatever this person's emotions are everybody has to accommodate that person's emotions and if you that's constantly what's happening maybe it's just sometimes best if that person's not part of the equation and it wasn't anything personal just that's how now from his side he he could feel totally differently um he could have hatred for me he could have um I, I think if anything probably just kind of feels like neutral just like ah, i just i'm it's just better for my life if i just sort of go forward and don't have this constant trigger in my life you know and i i sympathize with that because it's like man like i don't want to be around somebody every day of my life trying to like live in a van and a bus with them where they just every time they see me they feel terrible like about themselves like that sucks you know um and then with jordan i i really i truly don't know like anything because he just one day this isn't just me this is like the entirety of the whole process he just one day we were trying to reschedule a tour that had gotten canceled during covid and we reached out say hey they finally want to reschedule it for these dates like can everybody confirm and then nothing Uh, hey jordan what's up like we're trying to figure out what's up like you committed to these dates originally we're just trying to like have the new ones nothing and then months and months later go by later and he his attorney reaches out and says, Hey, Jordan's asked that, uh, only communication comes through me. And I just like, okay, well, what was the fight about? I, I, I mean, I'm not going to ask it $400 an hour what the fight was about. I don't even care at that point, you know? So, uh, that's the mystery right there. And if, you know, if you worked at, um, I don't know, say you owned a tire shop and you're just, that's it. You're just the owner of a tire shop, not even a band, but you've got five people working at the tire shop and one dude just doesn't show up to work on Monday. You call him the next Monday comes around, doesn't show up to work you know, 16 Mondays go by and this dude doesn't show up for work. It's, it's like at that point, you're not the jerk for saying, hey, dude, like we got, we got to move on without you. I mean, you're just kind of doing what you got to do at that point. Is that fair, though? Because you're I mean, he doesn't have equity in the tire shop like Jordan does in the band, right? He's a he's a member with equity. So I guess what I'm trying to say is. The band was started 
uh, by me. Jordan has quit on a couple different occasions back in the day. He was asked to be in the band by me. If he wants to say, you know, no, I'm not going to, the legality of it, because some of this stuff just gets insane, is like, if he wants to say like, oh, I'm, I'm owed a, you know, portion of ownership of this, that's totally fine. But the band exists to make music and perform music. So you can't just one day say, I don't want to do those things, but I want to make money from them. Like, that's absurd. Like, any judge in the world is going to be like, dude, you're out of your mind. But but some people get a severance from employment or get a sunset clause if they had equity, right? Like over a certain amount. For sure. Of time. For sure. And that, and that's like something we can figure out over time. I, I, I think that that's actually the easiest thing in the world to just like, Hey dude, like here's all the books. Like you see what we make, you know, what we make, there's not one dollar that's hidden from you. Like, what do you think is a fair way to handle this? You know? And as long as that, that whatever that is, is based in some sort of actual reality to where like, you know, the person's not delusionally thinking like, hey, I need I need $20 million to like be bought out of this band that I didn't even start. Like, you know, once that kind of thinking gets into the equation, it's just like, hey, dude, like, uh, I don't I don't even know what to say. Well, I, to think, I think you know? post, I think post prison, they lent you a lot of credibility by making the jump and trusting you and 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 vouching for you publicly. I know you guys aired it out and it seemed pretty candid and, and pretty real and authentic um, when you did. But that goes into like what a promoter would offer you or what a bigger band would offer you as a support or a festival would offer you. So that's why I bring up the equity part. And, and if there's a road back with those guys, obviously that's something you'll have to deal with if it provides value um, just you know, yeah. as a legit fan of the band, that yeah, I guess, like, if, if you don't mind, and, and this is like one where I have a lot of feelings about this because I don't really try to go around um, inserting my version of the story. I do very few interviews. I really, I really just want my my life is simple. I just want to play music. I started this band. I I start. I was the primary songwriter at that time, on guitar and everything. I just want to make music. I just want to perform music. The foundation of the band was like, we perform music, we play music. And if somebody doesn't want to do that, that's totally fine. They can leave. Well, but the machine keeps going because this is what I started. This is the foundation of what I started. And so it takes a certain amount of faith or trust, I guess is the word, or good faith from me toward them to actually ask them to play with me again. And that's one of the things I think has been misunderstood this whole time is when I first got released from incarceration, Every manager I talked to was like, do not do the band with those guys because what will happen is not, not all of them, but a couple of them is that you can tell just speaking to them for five minutes, the amount of emotion around this topic, they're going to be able to get past it for a certain amount of time. And then without like proper, you know, actual healing and therapy, like dedication to these kinds of things, it, it will fall apart. And they will leave and then people will think you were the bad guy. You're the reason that they left. They left. And so I had to actually just say like, I said to multiple managers, I don't care about that. I just want to do it anyways. Even if it hurts me in the long run, I just want to do it. And I, I like, I forced a square peg into a round hole for those dudes to all come back together. And every professional was just, I mean, probably the exception of, of Vaughn, because he, he's known us forever. Um, you know, it was just like, I, yeah, I think you guys could do it. Uh, it's a long shot, but I think you guys could do it. But uh, but just know, there was a certain amount of faith for me to say, here's two guys that have never been significant songwriters in the band. Behind the scenes, they've never changed the outcome of an album. And I'm going to go ahead and rebrand them as an integral classic member lineup that's like, this band cannot go forward without these guys. And they have the p potential ability to go burn me later by then leaving and being like, oh, it's just not the same as it used to be. And you know, the band's just like, feels different to me now. And, you know, maybe, I don't know, whatever comments could be made, they're welcome to have that opinion. But to me, it's just like, dude, behind the scenes, like nothing changes whether you're in this band or not. Like, you know, Phil and I still just keep writing records like we did since 2004. You know what I mean? So. Right. But to push back on it a little bit, you you know, you, the way that you make it sound, it, to be an employee at a tire shop is different. If, it, if, if, you, if they're salary guys, I totally get it like that's a behind the scenes thing that m maybe we don't even have the, the right to be privy to um but what they brought to the live show what they brought to the playing 
lie, regardless of the writing or whatever, the performances and the stage presence and just as great likable people and likable um, yeah, that's what I get. Characters, that that is a value like there's people that they go and they want to be on nick's side or they there's drummer sure. picked up you know and, and usually that's under the assumption that that like oh man this is the dude that like wrote this record and blah blah or whatever and and that's totally well, fine. Not, not away from anything you and, and phil wrote it's yeah. just it just added to what you and phil wrote so you know just to push back on that a, a little bit you 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 don't do yourself any favors by with the with the tire shop analogy. I get what you're saying. But I, I was just using that as any any company in the world. If even at the half owner, let's just no, say, I, I get it. Like it works for Mustaine. It works for certain dudes, and it could certainly work for you over time. But it doesn't. It doesn't feel like it's. It just doesn't feel like it's as commercially competitive or commercially successful. Yeah, but I I would happily give away half half my money no problem to just enjoy what i do with my life you know what i mean so that's where it comes down to it's like dude hey maybe the public likes a couple of these dudes way more than not maybe almost almost certainly i'm like very self-aware i'm certain that these people are more likable in a public square i just kind of when it comes down to my quality of life going forward it's just like dude like you mean i could just write music record music and perform music without it like being a constant amount of like drama and difficulty that sounds awesome like how how do i how much money do i have to give away for that to happen like that's cool with me and and i don't mean that like resentfully or angrily i think what they did was a very sincere effort like i think i can make this work they tried it they got into the nitty gritty of like wow like i feel triggered every day on a regular basis this is not sustainable i probably don't want to do this actually after a year or 18 months or whatever it was, you know, just like trying to push this thing to happen. It is completely understandable that they're like, man, like I, I, I don't feel as good about this as I thought I, I maybe would be able to grow to, to do. And man, like I, I, I'm super thankful that they like gave it a shot at all. And I knew that it could potentially hurt me. And, and it did, it did actually just as everybody behind the scenes, like predicted with me. And they said, don't do this. Cause this is exactly what's going to happen. All those things happen. And I still don't regret it. Cause it's like, you know what, dude, like I got a chance to, to like know with beyond doubt that like I tried my best and they tried their best. And now we don't have to like wonder like, Oh, I wonder what would happen if we tried to like all get back together. Yeah. Cause you get, you got another record out of it too, together where everybody played on it. Right. It wasn't just you yeah. or, or, yeah, I mean, obviously we live in an era where, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe guys get a little bit of assistance at times. You know what I mean? Because like, and it's not even a, a talent issue. It's just the nature of like. Sometimes you write a song, and you show a dude like two hours before he's recording his parts. Like, here, here's the part you're recording, right? You know what I mean? So sometimes it's it's not as much of a live kind of feel making a record as as you know. You know, sometimes you'll last minute day before you're supposed to go record the record, you write one more song that just happens to be wow, this song is awesome. I'm not going to not include it in the record, but like my drummer's never had a chance to learn it. Like. You know, the second guitar player might not even play on it because he's never even learned the riffs. You know what I mean? There's situations like that happen all the time. Um, and then people get attributed to like making this record collectively together. And it's not necessarily that way, but it doesn't mean that they didn't try to make a record together. You know, so we tried we tried to make a record together. We did a lot of the record we did make together. And some of the record was very selectively recorded by, you know, only certain individuals. So you, you, I'm sure you've heard people say, you know, I separate the art from the artist or I can't separate the art from the artist, right? Cause you're, you're kind of in that conversation when those things are said, is there, is there an artist that you can't separate the art from the artist? Fortunately for me, I just, it's a coincidence. There wasn't like an artist. There's artists that have done things. I'm like, I could never listen to that music again, you're, but, but I just never listened to it to begin with. So it's kind of like. I guess like not an issue. I do love this genre of music like as much now in 2024 as I did in 2020 when I started the band, right? So it's like, as a fan of this genre, if I wasn't in As La Dying, I would love love the music that As La Dying's created because it's just like in my wheelhouse, you know? And if I try to step out of that and look at like, how would I feel, you know? And and this is rational Tim thinking, not not the Tim that ever went down the dark hole, but just a guy who's like, let's just say I've never done something terrible like that in my life. I would probably look at this situation and be like, I'm going to take it as it comes because if 
if the next record exudes like you know art actual like artistic awareness of of the mistakes this person has made and they're actually um you know creating art that like takes that into account and and shows progress in their personal life like i i could get on board let's just like let's see what happens you know and that's like how i would take it and um i'm also a sucker for like there are bands where i just blatantly do not I would never have the singer especially over for dinner or want to go to a barbecue with this person or whatever. But I listen to music all the time. Dude, that's just a great song. Like, and it's not even that I hate or like the person. It's just like, I have, I mean, you know, I, I hate using examples. So I just, I can't, I can't really use one because I don't, but I'm sure you've met tons of front men, especially along your, like, damn, like, I, I would, I would be so bummed if that dude came to the barbecue at my house. But I love, I, when that song plays, I just like, like the inner 14 year old of me just wants to go get in the pit yeah <laughs> yeah for sure hey everybody quick interruption letting you know letting you know today's show is brought to you by indiemerchstore.com our main stage presenter at the milwaukee metal fest 2024 and let me tell you indie merch store is not playing around they got that big chaos and carnage tour going out so they got all the merch from those bands including vitriol we just had kyle on the podcast that was a great chat but they got cattle decapitation on there, Carnifex, Rivers of Nile, Humanity's Last Breath, who I've played on the Patreon show a bunch. People love them. It's all happening now. Go to IndieMerchStore.com and check out the tour, which will be hitting the road starting April 30th. Go to ChaosAndCarnage.com for your tickets and VIPs. And again, to grab merch from any of those bands, visit IndieMerchStore.com. Also want to thank CenturyMedia.store. Big shout out to Century Media. You can see bands like Bewitcher, bands like Skeletal Remains, bands like Stabbing, and so many others at the Milwaukee Metal Fest 2024. And check out centurymedia.store to order any of their great records. No coupon code needed. Support the label, support the bands. Big thanks to centurymedia.store. Now back to the show. And what about um, what about Faith, right? Because there's there's especially after that last chat you did with the um the therapist which i suggest people go uh check out the guy had a really he had a really like nice calm voice it was a very easy listen um where are you at with that yeah i i think the one thing i try to avoid is just like um concrete titles uh because i i just don't think that's really important right now i don't first of all i I don't think people should be if you're looking to me for direction on how to be closer to god your higher power or whatever like you're looking in the wrong place you know let's just get that out out there for starters i think my life has shown that i think that if you're looking for shown that there is a god or there is no god what's that shown that there is a god or there is no god just if, if you're looking to me as like a way to to the words of Tim, how can they help me get closer to God or how can they help me be closer to my higher power or whatever it is? I'm just saying like, you're, if you're looking for, to me for wisdom in general, you're looking in the wrong place. I could tell you about my failures, tell you what I've learned in the aftermath of my failures, but you know, I don't think that I've shown the public that I'm the, you know, the beacon of, of wisdom to listen to for, for, for like, you know, how to like properly view every little detail in life. With that said, I went from one extreme as like a, um, conservative evangelical almost fundamentalist style of christian to um getting my my degree in religious studies and the breakdown that happened as a result of me learning there's certain things that are just um in that environment i think like dangerous it's like insist that the world was literally created in six days and insist that you know the story of uh jonah and the big fish was actually literally like a literal story and once you start insisting all these things are, are literal and not not figurative at all, then it starts to break down. And so, so then as, as some of this stuff started to break down for me, I went from like, like upholding this as the most important thing in my life to be like, Oh, well, I feel like I've been lied to my whole life. And I've, and I had this like emotional reaction. Like I reject this all. And I, you know, there's nothing that only naturalistic causes have created this planet. And, you know, it went really far to that side. Um, you know, and there's like a hedonistic like mindset that comes with all that. So I think where I'm at now is I would prefer to not like get on here and define which version of, uh, you know, religion I, I believe in, but I do believe there's lots of wisdom greater than myself. Some of that is beyond um, what we know as like 
science and humans and what we know. And I, and I do believe, um, I, I do believe Jesus was extraordinarily wise and way ahead of his time. And my life is and will be better following the teachings of Jesus. Now, in terms of the details of like the, the, some of the stuff Paul said, and like all these like crazy details that are in these sometimes ancient myths, sometimes ancient texts, whatever you want to call them. Like that's where I, I start to tell people, I'm not sure if we're like agreeing on all the details, but like I tell my dad all the time, I said, when it comes to what matters most in life, we're on the same team, like to love the poor and the oppressed, the outcasted of society, the people that, that Jesus paid attention to that everybody else like thought religion was above. Like that's, those are my people at this point. I mean, I've literally been incarcerated. I work in addiction treatment. Like those are my people. So when it comes to the big stuff, my dad and I were hundred percent on the same page when it comes to like some nuanced, you know, detail about, um, what is or isn't supernatural like you know i have i have a, like a healthy degree of skepticism with all that did you did you pray like leading up to your sentencing like please let me let me get a shorter sentence and let me get out of here and do good in the world like what was your what was your faith like then and do and did you pray in, during during your your time it's hard to like it's a very dramatic time. So in terms of uh, clear memories, I don't really have some of it like a blur. I mean, I remember specifically like being in isolation in prison because I spent like a month in isolation, got out of that, went to like a normal population for like literally like three days and then got sent back to a, a different like a uh, hot, what do they call it? Um, high power cells where like the more, you know, dangerous or whatever you call it, like high power High power co comes more so from like the gang world. I'm, I obviously wasn't part of that, but I got housed with those dudes that need to be separated from each other all the time. And so then I was um, either isolated again or or just me and a cellmate on lockdown for like m months and months at a time. And I remember during that time tapping into this part of my brain, I was like, our brains are designed to like have a sense of spirituality. And if I ignore that and I block that out, that is like very unhealthy, especially in these circumstances. And um I do remember like consciously trying to reconnect with the spiritual part of my brain and not necessarily knowing like all of my concrete beliefs at that time. Cause I had sort of switched from one end to the other and now I was trying to find the middle. And I think that's still where I'm at right now is like trying to find value what Jesus taught and try to separate that from what has been like become legend and myth over time. You know what I mean? And so that, that way I can have a healthy sense of spirituality and not just a bizarrely religious dogmatic sense. Well, so, you know, so I, I had said that you were coming on the podcast to a friend of mine today and, and they had said to me, you know, the, the, just the plot not going through was like proof to them that there was a God. And I, and I thought about that because it could have been so much worse. Right. Yeah if it had gone through and the mother of your children, you know, was killed, then that might be a case that there, there isn't a God, but do you, have you ever thought about that? So I've, I mean, I've definitely thought about a lot about how fortunate I am that the person I, the person that approached me, I would say the person I talked to, but I want to clarify it. Like the person that initially approached me. And then of course I, I spoke back to this person was a government agent. I mean, I'm, I'm very thankful that I, this crime was initiated by a government agent. I went along with this person. I very clearly made it um, like with both action and intent that like I was willing to go down this road. Um, it was never a real true threat or opportunity to like actually commit a crime, fortunately. And I, I did not know that at the time. And so that's obviously where the guilt of my heart comes in very, very clearly. And I just think about how fortunate it is because, you know, I don't know how often this is ever going to happen in life, but if in a weird, bizarre off chance, I was approached by somebody who wasn't a government agent that just said, Hey dude, I know that you didn't even bring up this topic and you weren't even thinking about it, or at least, at least conversationally, of course, you know, I've had dark thoughts in my head, but, but in terms of that particular day, I wasn't even thinking about it, you know, and this person came up and said, Hey dude, I'm going to like, I, I got an idea how to like solve the problems you got going on in your life. I think that's like statistically pretty much a zero, you know what I mean? So like with that said, I, I'm, I know where I was willing to go. I know the guilt that is in my heart. I know what I said. I know what I did. But I'm not really worried that there's like a true threat to society out there. 
uh, in these situations. I think that's like something that's just like for the sake of accuracy of the story, like I have to say that not because I feel like that gives me an excuse, but because I think that people sometimes wonder like, man, like, like a society safe with a guy like that out there. And it's like, guys, like, let's look at the actual true, like cold, hard facts here. Like, you know, yeah, I, 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 safety is not an issue, but with that said, uh, because just if, if you were like, if you were feeling there was a God and that you were going to face judgment, for this um you know people want to know that that's i think that's a fair especially knowing your work now and what you're trying to do turn a negative to a positive um you know people will say hey i'm no one to judge and i and i've said that i'm not judging you your character i'm judging the actions i'm judging the mistake you know everybody's allowed to make mistakes but to have a moral imperative now to have you know goals now and to help people to me it would be in the back of my mind of like okay yeah maybe is the sentence just being here in this realm and we pay for it that way or is there an afterlife where we will be judged again i mean yeah, i am interested to hear what you you know what, what yeah, you yeah. feel about that yeah in terms of the afterlife i mean i i don't know um one of the reasons i'm hesitant to like to find some of these things is just like i i think there's a lot a lot more i need to learn you know like i i don't think that i'm even in my own life i i'm making educated guesses as to like how i feel on any given day about a topic and i might feel differently like literally a week from now on some of these like eternal topics right um but in terms of um the real issue and the root of this is that i lacked empathy as a human being because i saw my own hurt and I was hyper focused on it to the point where whatever solved that problem for me, it didn't matter the cost to other people because my hurt was the only hurt that, that I saw and felt. And I was like oblivious to the way that it would hurt another person. That is like textbook lack of empathy. And I'm sure like I can, could conceptualize, I was a smart enough human being to say, oh yeah, you know, if this, if a person dies and that her parents and her siblings and her cousins and the ripple effect is just is just tr you know tremendous you know like i'm super aware of that that i could conceptually understand that but in terms of the feelings like i didn't emotionally feel anything but my own pain and then as a result of you know let's go back to like the concept of being in isolation right in in, in prison like there's one thing to be in prison another another thing to like spend you know four and a half months in in isolation and lockdown the amount of thought process i had there and the amount of like pain that i became in touch with was just like, man, like this isn't even scratching the surface of what it would have felt like for people who weren't even incarcerated, had had a, had an actual life been taken, those people would have felt a greater pain than this, having done nothing wrong. I'm talking about like parents and siblings and things like that. And it would be ongoing and there, there may not, like with my case, I sat there in isolation for four and a half months, but I knew that the maximum that I could be in that prison would have been three years. I said, as much as this hurts, it's gonna end in three years. Um, and it's really empathy that drives my sense of morality at this point, because I hate pain and suffering. Like I hate it. And I think that if there's an opportunity in life to alleviate that or to minimize that for another person, I, I take it. And that's like the nonprofit work and stuff. I don't really want to like talk about that because I'm not trying to promote my, my work in those fields. But the, the reason I get into that stuff and I, I'm so steadily involved in it is because I see like situations where people are struggling and in pain and I could do something that's relatively easy for me and it alleviates incredible amounts of pain for them. So with that said, like that's sort of like my my compass at this point is uh is just that just I just don't want people to be in pain. I felt I felt enough of it in my life. And and you did you have any sort of experiences in there or, or dreams or do you have dreams now where you feel a spiritual connection or you um have any sort of heightened senses telepathy or any sort of awakening um whether it's while you're working out or meditating or any anything like that well i could say the easiest thing would probably be for me to have come out of this like post-incarceration experience and you know even if i like fabricated it to some degree tell the world like oh i had this enlightening awakening experience where i just i'm a new man and like you know just really went hard on the, the whole charisma angle right but like i'm sort of 
not really the most charismatic person. I'm just like a calm dude that just likes a thought provoking conversation. And it's like, I, I, I can't be something that I'm not, I can't say that I had this crazy experience. You know, there's definitely things that are, are far beyond, um, what I believe is like natural to this world that have happened, you know, in terms of, um, you know, I had, I had a friend who called me or sorry that I, I, who tried to write me letters while I was incarcerated. They didn't get to me at the time. And then I, and then I finally got them all way later. And I looked at the date of those, those records. And he said, Hey, I don't know why, but God told me that I should tell you that a guy named Bill is going to come like help you right, right now. And I was like, what? That, that makes no sense. And then I looked at it. And at the time that I was reading this book, it was, it was a book written by a guy named William Lane Craig. Right. And, and I was reading that book and it was like, I didn't necessarily agree with everything that was said in there, but it really like connected me with me spiritually on, on some of the, some of these concepts. And so I remember just thinking like, that's, that's super bizarre. You know I mean? There's some, some bizarre stuff that I don't have great answers for that have happened to me and I'm not devoid of spirituality, but I also, I would feel like some sort of false prophet to come out and say like, Oh man, I've had this, this enlightening experience. And now I, I know things that I didn't know before. And that, like, please listen to me, you know, like, I, I just want to make music, dude. I just love making music. Like I'm, I play my guitar, writing riffs all the time. Like I have so many projects that I want to do just because the idea of, um, the idea of like outputting music is so therapeutic to me that it, 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 it is in a sense, like a huge portion of what connects me to, to a world greater than like what's in my brain. And what about family? Like you're remarried now. Would you start a new family? Um, that's a, uh, take, take your time. I don't think I've, uh, I don't think I've healed enough to be able to, to tackle that topic right now. And just in my life in general, not even for this podcast, just, I think the loss. I think the loss hurts me enough to the point where I don't know how I could wrap my mind around that right now. No, going into this, there was no limit, and I appreciate that. There was no guidelines. Um, you know, you've been you've been nothing but candid and. Um, just this whole takeaway, my whole takeaway, and I guess it's always come down to communication. And more of it seems to help, right? Less of it leads to understanding, leads to misunderstandings, leads to, you know, people assuming shit. And, and that was always like my gripe beyond the obvious, right? Was because... I try to I try to have a takeaway from the show. I, I try to have like a purpose. It's not just let's sell some ads and do a podcast because I got some free time because um, I don't have free time, you know, and I, I appreciate you taking the time today. I appreciate people who will listen to this with an open mind um, because it's even between now and when it gets released and when the podcast uh, gets relaunched and everything, you know, I always think about the ripple effects yeah. and, you know, words matter. Um, the questions we ask matter. The, the topics we discuss matter. And 
through the communication I've had with our listeners and with our patrons here, and I'll get to some of them in a second, I've learned so much not only about myself, but about how the world works. And today, even you know, more about you and more about the prison system and, and more about um, you know, your state of mind when you were going through these things. And I just hope that this just leads to more communication that hopefully will aid in someone's quest, whether it's for rehabilitation or whether it's for inspiration to, to write music or to get in shape or whatever it might be. Um, but I appreciate it. And, um, and yeah, let's go to, let's go to some of the, the patrons here who are looking forward to having so, you. on uh, that that topic just to, to wrap up i think like um we have a tendency and it's why we like you know superhero movies and stuff to view is like entirely good person or entirely bad person and life is so complicated man I, i'm not at all saying like hey i'm a i'm a great person sitting here but i do know there's good there's a lot of good in, in me and i do know that i've done uh, something terribly wrong so you know, there's not a lot of good answers that are people are going to walk away and think like, oh, cool. Like, I see it. It's black and white. It's just so clear now. Like, I think if, uh, <laughs> if there was a way to view me that was just like the correct answer, you know, then then you could just get like some professor with a whiteboard to like explain how you're supposed to view Tim Lambesis, right? But but there isn't, you know, and pe people are just, you know, I've, I've met, being incarcerated, I've met incredible people that did a terrible thing and i've also met people that are in there for this the littlest slap on the wrist like drug charge that actually like in their gang life have killed all kinds of i mean they literally killed like eight people and they're there their only reason they're there is because they you know they had like slightly too much meth in their pocket you know um so it's just it's a really um case by case basis and people are allowed to feel however they want to feel yeah and I'm happy you brought that up because anytime I've dealt with anyone who's gone down that dark path in my life, I always deep down rooted for them to turn it around and, and win. And, and unfortunately with my, and I know a lot of people, I'm not, everybody out there has a story like this where it's, whether it's your uncle, whether it's your dad, your mom, someone in your family, I mean, I'm, I'm Irish, you know, but my, my whole family is Irish Catholic. There's a little bit of German on one side, but mostly Irish. And, you know, we've, we've been through it all the suicides, the, you know, the, the prison stints, going and visiting my uncle in jail, bringing, you know, I'm only being able to bring him one sheet from the magazine, bringing him clean socks. And deep down, I always wanted, no matter what they had done, I always wanted them to get their life back on track and so um you know even the last I, even before i saw you last i think i saw you in germany you know i went i ran the gamut of emotions like first i went back to the bus and i thought man we get fucking hemmed up at the border for wayne like fighting a mall cop and we can't get into canada this motherfucker gets into europe no problem <laughs> and then I'm then I'm on the bus and I'm thinking about our interaction and I because I was looking in your eye and I'm I'm thinking about when I used to look my uncle in the eye and I would think you know is he is he gonna just go back down the bad path and and go and you know go back to the booze go back to the drugs go back to jail um and and I couldn't really tell you know I I didn't know only time will tell especially yeah. if you're not super close to someone you know we weren't we weren't ever like so close where we were talking to each other every day or whatever we were more of acquaintances or co-workers and you never really truly know someone but it doesn't mean you have to shut off empathy totally it doesn't mean like you said it's a case-by-case -case basis and there are people who've done way worse things and don't get caught um but we hope that just as a society as a whole that our conversations, our actions, our songs, whatever, especially my songs and my lyrics, I hope people get inspiration from them to not do these things and not go down these roads where it leads you to death, jail, a hospital bed, whatever it might be, um, just because I've seen it, you know, yeah. 
both ways, both sides. And the and to me, I get up every day and I go, thank God I didn't do what I knew I was capable of doing. The only thing is I just <laughs> stay away from those people that might draw me towards that, stay away from those substances that might draw me towards that and look at my daughter, look at my family, look at our patrons here, our fans on the road. And, you know, I would have, I would be a hypocrite if I didn't have you on the show, you know, knowing how many, um, you know, people who have written me, I mean, I have thousands. I, I saved every letter. I read every letter, thousands of people who just, you know, want to change their situation, want to change their life around. So, um, thanks again for, again, you know, if you're just listening to this now, there was no, you know, I get the final say in this edit. There was no funny business going into this. There was no like, don't talk about this. Don't talk about that. And that that's more than a lot of guests will give. That's more than people that, you know, never did anything <laughs> that, that, you know, they don't want to talk about this and they don't want to talk about that. So I want people to know that. And I, and I think, um, I think that's a, a big deal knowing how censored everything is and knowing how people self censor. So, um, again, the takeaway is communication, having the tough conversations when you can, and hopefully being able to walk away with something that's, uh, you know, more than you, what you entered today with. So Tim, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I know, I know that's, uh, you, you get exposed to a lot of criticisms, just, uh, just having me on here. So I, I know that you had to think a lot about it and thanks for giving me the opportunity. Yeah. And we'll do it again, man. Um, and thanks everybody. I know we didn't get to your questions, but, um, I think, I think everybody in here is satisfied. Like I said before, you know, we literally only, the only text we really traded recently was literally right before this. And I said, you know, we will get, take some questions from the patrons. Um, so I owe you guys one, but I don't see any here. So it's not like I'm, uh, I'm not going to it. And if, you know, listen, if you come back on and between now and when you come back on, if anybody thinks I served you up softballs or if anybody has anything to say, they know where to find me. Just the show at Gmail. They've been finding me since we started this podcast. Uh, but, I, but I'm pretty uh, pleased with how this all went. So thanks again. Yeah. And I, uh, if I'm, I'm not saying that your questions were overly hard, but I don't, I don't, if those weren't the hard questions, I don't really want to know what the hard ones are. Cause, cause it's not, you know, it's not easy to talk about. I want to move forward in my life. I want to be able to say to people, I've addressed that. I've discussed that. Like I, you know, you know where I stand on that. You have explained my past. Um, and you know, this is probably one of the last times that I'll, I'll be addressing that like as formally as I have, because I think that you, you really went to like some corners to find stuff that hasn't been talked about yet, you know, because you took time to comb through all the, the letters and, and emails and comments, you know, of like what people are feeling like is not addressed about this. And um, I'll, I'll never close the door entirely, but I do like being able to say, okay, that was hard. That was a really hard discussion, but I had it. And so now I don't need to like publicly talk about that 400 more times. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I accept all the constructive criticisms. I, it wasn't that I wanted to gloss over the new music and stuff like that, but knowing our history, knowing how long the podcast had been going on, like while I, I know it's, I know it's been a minute and I'm going to relaunch and, and I know this will get a lot of attention, but um, you know, my thing going into this was we're not, I'm not looking for, I don't even do that clickbaity stuff. I don't even send out pull quotes or anything like that. Like a lot of podcasts do. It was really, again, more about, can we take away something positive for this and, and, and feel free, you know, like I said on the text beforehand, like whatever you want to plug, I know that there are diehard fans that have been following you um, all throughout and might not even have listened to this podcast ever that will say, Hey, you, you know, you didn't even address the new album, but from what I understood, it was, it was being mixed and, and, um, it's going to come out this year, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's just to like address some of this stuff. The new Asla Dying record, um, worth the tail end of mixing it. Our mix engineers, um, he went on a little personal trip, and when he gets back, he's going to finish the last three songs. And as it relates to like Austrian Death Machine, as an example, I, I didn't feel like it would be appropriate to finish my incarceration and one year later be running around telling jokes, you know what I mean? So I, I waited. And the goal was always to wait until after the second Asla Dying record to then 
do the Austrian death machine record. Cause I felt like at that point, it's very clear, you know, that I'm, I, I do not take anything that's happened in my life lightly. But with that said, there's enough delays in the Asla dying record that Phil and I had a conversation. He said, dude, just go ahead and get, get it done now because, um, who knows, who knows what the release date is on this Asla dying record. Now, now we do, now we have an idea. It's this year for sure. But, um, it was good to be able to, to have fun. Cause that's a part of my personality that, dude, you know, this, like from being on the road, like if, if you're just every band is a slayer riff after slayer riff, just super dark, heavy lyrics. And it's just like, man, like sometimes I just like to joke around with my friends and have fun. Like that's also also a part of my personality, you know? And I feel like it was okay for me to have that as an outlet again at some point. And I, I think the timing is okay, you know? And, and uh, but I'm just making it clear that I did that record because I feel like where I'm at in my life is a place where, um, I've addressed my past. This is even yet another step in that. And uh, dude, I, I I think the Austrian Death Machine record is a lot of fun. I think the the riffs on there are probably like almost too good for Austrian Death Machine at times because it sounds uh, it sounds like a really modern mixture of like all kinds of different styles. Which historically I kind of like just stuck to the the thrash core kind of thing and just kind of pumped them out really fast. I, I write the songs and like you know, the first record I wrote, you know, each song took me like a little over an hour to write and I just would just kind of go for it. And I just all my thrash roots from growing up, uh, listening to eighties, nineties thrash music just kind of came out on that first record. And this record, because of all the time I had sitting around, it's this big, diverse, interesting album. And even if you took the like jokes out of it, it's still like a good metal record. And where can they find it? Like, where can they get it? And what's the, what label is the, as I lay dying going to be on? Uh, I can't say the, as a dying label, yet because we're like this close to having it all figured out but is it uh, rpm what's that is it rpm no i, I it's not but i I'll, i won't answer any more about that because by yeah. process of elimination we could try to get, but no i i'm um i released the the austrian death machine record through napalm records um which is very fitting an Aus- actual austrian record label right Tom, and, um, thomas yeah yeah thomas is a great dude that we sat down and had lunch and we talked about it and uh it's just it's cool because I self you know, and I, I co-wrote some songs, so I don't want to take too much credit, but um I self-produced, you know, recorded everything here in my place, so self-produced it, uh wrote it, mixed it, and you know, there's, there's of course flaws in there. So you know, I, I the more I try to take credit for all the production of the Austrian Death Machine record, the more somebody could be like, Oh, you're a terrible mix engineer, or whatever. But that's the point is is like I just gotta just enjoy making music with really no checks and balances other than just making sure I'm happy with it. And then Napalm was like, if you're happy with it, that's what matters to us. Like, let's put the record out. And that was a really cool relationship to have that. Right on. Right. On. Yeah. They, they seem to have a, a great thing going right now. I, I, I worked with them on both these Snyder records and they did a great job um, just producing those and, and putting them out through them. So just one more real quick. I see it. Here's a good one from JJ Hernandez. Is Ken Susie an official member of As I Lay Dying? And I'll add to that. Like, did you did you get riffs from him? Did he do any co-writes? So there's a song Ken and I worked on. Um, just the way that it worked out in this record, it was like Phil and I had already been putting together our different demos and just like sending them into like one big Dropbox folder. And we each had so many ideas that it was like, well, we don't necessarily need more material. But then as you get further along in the record, you realize like, oh, like we're missing a little bit of this, you know, and there's a there was like a a riff of my or sorry, a riff of Phil's specifically that I had been working on trying to make a song off of that one riff of Phil's that that was just was just it was just epic. But like we never had a full arrangement for it. So I started working on that. And I said, I can picture after this intro, like a very unearthy sounding mid tempo stompy riff coming in. And so then, you know, called Ken and got him involved. And I think that going forward well he'll be more so involved in and in, in adding his solos and stuff as well but um in terms of the official member status um i mean to me it's as official as it gets in terms of being like the press photo is is all of us you know what i mean and that's uh you know we're not we're not like having open tryouts like you know we're not looking for anybody else in terms of paperwork one of the funny and interesting things about paperwork with Asla dying all for all these years is that um other than me being the clearly like the founding member and all the original paperwork nobody else has ever been on the paperwork technically besides me all these years and the only claim to being a part of that paperwork by another former member is like 
is literally like an accident that happened on a tax return. But other than that, like I've always just been the sole actual paper member of the band. And so uh, I don't think the like technicalities of who's who, I think it's like, you know, I don't take more money than other people. I don't do any of that kind of stuff. Like I own the band. Ken is not technically on the paperwork, but he's definitely, um, he's, he's here as long as he wants to be here, you know, and, and we're having a great time. And uh, we already talked about trying to write more songs for another record because he came in late enough in the songwriting process that he really only got to put his stamp primarily on that one song. And so it's like, I'm kind of craving more of, of his input going forward. Right on. Well, tell Ken, I said, what's up? He's got my number. He's, yeah, the Wrangler. The you know what's interesting is because the Ken can speak to like the behind the scenes stuff better than me because he's such a outside perspective because he's toured with us as a not a member of Azadine when we toured with Unearth and then he's been in Azadine and he's seen like the inner workings to like why it works for the group of guys we have now and why it might not have worked for other groups of dudes and so he's actually probably the most insightful guy and at first he was like, dude, we should do the Josta show together because then. When Jamie asked questions about, you know, what's going on with the band and like former members and this and that, he's like, I, he's like, I feel like I'm actually the authority on that. And I was like, dude, you kind of, kind of are to some degree. Well, there was, there was some questions I thought I'll save it if we ever do a part two, like, you know, whatever happened to Evan and what are, you know, where, like, would you ever get those guys back in the fold if you needed to? But I ran into Evan actually at the the gym, like a few months ago, uh, he works out like a f friend of mine from high school and, uh, he lives like 10 minutes from me and. We still have each other's numbers and stuff. Um, Cause he kind of like co-produced too, right? Like he had a recording scenario. Yeah, so like the first record, well, I call it the first record. It's not technically, but Frail Words Collapse, the first like record. And he's um, credited, him and I are credited as producing that record together. It was like one of those things where um, he wasn't the style of guitar player that like wrote a lot of riffs, but he was really good at like arranging songs and, and like refining things ideas that i had and he he would actually like have to rewrite some parts of mine occasionally so i don't want to say that he never wrote because he definitely uh rewrote or fixed parts of mine and all that kind of stuff but with that said i realized like as we got closer to finishing the record i was like well dude like your your stamp on this record is like because i because i shared in like the songwriting or or, or was writing the majority of the riffs so like your your stamp on this record is like largely as a producer as well as a guitar player um and uh I think the final arrangements of those songs a lot in a lot of ways um, really had to, had to go through him because when, when you're the one like writing the riffs, you sort of like start to lose perspective a little bit and you need that second person to like give your riffs direction. Well, definitely want to hear the new stuff. And yeah, Ken, Ken's always welcome on. You could tell him, you know, maybe closer to the, it, once you have a release date or whatever um, and then a tour or, or something to promote. Get old, yeah. and he can promote fucking what is it, Fishman? What is it? What is this? What's his? I game? feel like I feel like those pickups are are standard in in most like higher level guitars at this point. Oh, so. I mean, listen, I got to give Fishman a lot of credit. I mean, he's getting, he's out there. I'm seeing it more than ever. I feel like so he's obviously doing something right. Well, it's funny because I'm like one of the big skeptics because I um I'm one of those nerds that will like put five different pickups in the same guitar before I start recording a song to like make sure that it's the best pickup for that guitar. And every time I was like, Oh, I think this one might beat the fishman. He's like, no, 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 let me send you this. And then he's, you know, he sends me something that beats it. So, uh, he had to work hard to, to, yeah. to convert me. No, believe me. There's, there's dudes that I see that are, I know that are fucking, that are really, really, really critical of that stuff. And they use fishman. So, Shout out. I would they're not a sponsor. And neither of us get any money, but maybe yeah. maybe Ken can buy us dinner because because of this conversation. At least a sandwich. All right, Tim. Thanks again, man. And thanks everybody. Thanks, Michael. And yeah, just cl closer to the record when you have a plan and a tour. Uh Ken Ken and, and you are, are welcome back. All right, cool, man. And I do have to say, I'm doing my first ever European Austrian Death Machine tour. I'm announcing that next week, actually. So all right, yeah. So, the, so you can announce it, yeah, because uh, this won't air until the following week. So, yeah. So, uh, who's going to be the support? Uh, there's a band from Europe called Distant and uh, Ghost Iris. They're both going to be supporting. Um, for Americans, I think Distant is sort of somewhat of a new listen, but they're they're doing really well in Europe. Yeah, no, we've we they we played them on the monthly music show, played them on the weekly metal roundup on Patreon. People really liked them. Yeah. I think we even thought about having them on Milwaukee Metal Fest too. But yeah, they're from Germany, right? 
I, I want to say technically, I think they're from maybe like uh, like closer to Copenhagen, Denmark area, but I, I, I'm terrible sometimes with that. So I uh, no disrespect to those guys if I get get it wrong, but I'm looking forward to meeting you in person and hanging out and maybe even sharing some gear, you know, because I'm getting like back in the van, like I'm going old school, you know. That's one of the cool things about where I'm at in my career is like, you know, I've been doing this like 20, going on my 24th year and I'm just as stoked to like get in a van and just slug it out as I, I was when I was a kid. I mean, you know, maybe my, my body isn't as well adapted, but dude, I, I just really truly feel like every time I get on stage or, or just, even if I'm in the studio recording a song, it's like, man, I remember when I, I wondered if I would ever have a chance to do this again. And I sincerely for a very, very long time thought, um, like the best I might be afforded ever is like some special event, like one time or something, you know, or like some like, you know, like little crumb that somebody was willing to throw my way, you know, and, and I I really thought that uh, I would never have a chance to play music, either either recorded in an environment where people would actually, you know, release it on a global scale. I thought like, you know, this is again, when I went to uh, when I went to prison as well record labels were such an important thing and then you know obviously all these years later it's like dude i mean there's a little skepticism as to how much record labels really help compared to a self-release you know what i mean and, and so I, I think it's just a different climate i'm very fortunate to have this opportunity and uh, i'm super thankful for it yeah i think that tour will be good i i still i still sign those cds every now and then on the tour right on you know and it's funny when people will uh will bust it out because I think of Lorenzo or whoever gave it to me originally, right? Was was he the one that connected us on that? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I did a couple songs with Lorenzo too. And the funny thing about the song we did together is it um, got sometime while I was incarcerated, it got on a playlist, like a workout yeah. playlist or something. And then it, it was like nowhere near. It was like, I'm not saying it's 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 always been a great song, but it was like, you know, the lower half of like what was like popularly streamed on that record when the record came out. And then when I first saw like spotify numbers or whatever it was after being incarcerated I, it was like very definitively like the the number one most streamed Austrian machine song and i i had no idea how it happened because the whole idea of like spotify playlisting and all that like wasn't really like a big thing on my radar before i went in so like the whole music industry changed like what was the lead single on that album completely changed and, and it was it was just kind of cool for me to absorb all those uh those like nostalgic like wow i made this record and i kind of forgot about it and now it's you know now it's actually making some some waves for sure yeah no we we had an interaction too where i was like hey this is gonna be a deep cut right like what what's what, it's not gonna be a video or a single because i just sang i don't know i i must have sang on like fucking seven records that year or whatever but yeah. but yeah it's uh it's definitely stood the test of time and people will people will be doing their reps and head into your show that's for sure <laughs> um well thanks again and thank you i will get to your questions on the next one we'll be back monday we got josh todd from buck cherry coming on so join us for that all right everybody just a quick outro for you if you enjoy the show hit us with an email josh the show at gmail or if you want to donate to the show it's paypal.me slash josta that's paypal.me slash josta any amount gets you a shout out on the show maybe you want a shout out on tim lambesis part two which is coming up very soon and ken Susie of formerly of unearth currently of as i lay dying will be sitting in on that episode as well big thanks to ken and tim for the candid chat so yeah reserve your judgment um until you hear part two and then, yeah, let's hear from you. We will be doing a pod after the pod exclusively for our patrons over at patreon.com slash Josta. And if you want to hear a bunch of the episodes like episode 700 coming out with um, Steve Vai and a bunch of others, you can go to gasdigital.com or check out the audio versions on patreon.com slash Josta. Also got to thank indiemerchstore.com, your one-stop shop for all things metal, death metal, grindcore, metalcore murder metal, whatever you want to call it, power metal. We got everything at IndieMerchStore.com and they are presenting the main stage. They are one of our top sponsors of the Milwaukee Metal Fest 2024. So head on over to IndieMerchStore.com, use the code JOSTA10 for 10% off everything at Indie Merch Store. And you will see they have a ton of great records from your favorite labels like Metal Blade, Relapse, Unique Leader, and all the bands that you want the merch from right now. They got Lauren Ashore, High on Fire, Cattle Decapitation, and many more. Use the code JOSTA10 at IndieMerchStore.com. Of course, I got to thank Dunnable Guitars. Head on over to DunnableGuitars.com. You'll see 
They got a great deal if you want a custom build right now, dunableguitars.com and of course, centurymedia.store. Big thanks to Century Media, another one of our sponsors for the festival. Go to centurymedia.store. Get yourself a mayhem on vinyl. Get yourself Bewitcher. Get yourself some skeletal remains, dog. Drink your coffee. Do your push-ups. Listen to death metal. Support centurymedia.store. Support martyrstore.net. Use the code JJ10. And come see us on tour with Hatebreed, Carcass, Harm's Way, and Crypta. Starting in September, it's going almost till Halloween. Get your tickets now at hatebreed.com. And uh, we'll see you at Milwaukee Metal Fest and the big Texas Metal Fest in May. So that's coming up next month. And we'll be back with Steve Vai, with John Five, with Daughtry. We, I mean, we got a ton of great episodes. Marty Friedman's coming back on. You'll see them all very soon. Thanks for all your support. Love you all. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Executive producers, Jake Olszewski, Ben Lee, AJ Lewis, Garrett Keeping, Dan Smith, Nick Torito, JJ Hernandez, Joe Bartovic, Jason Jarvis, Chris Larice, Alex Smolin, Todd McKee, John Blewett, Richard Miller, Kyle Marg, Nate Leffingwell, Morgan Costner, Mark Tag, Zapagor Waikato, Niall Scollard, Kathy D'Ambrosio, Justin Steven, Jack Flanders, the Pit Commander, Andy Wilson, Jeffrey Kuhn, Kimo Humalamaki, Jonathan Metis, Brandon Cooper, Matthew Jankowskis, Jamie Kutcher, Ryan Undercoffler, Matt West, Ryan Maurice, Chad Green, Dallas Hendricks, Jacob Arensberg, Kenneth Moore, Kona Butterflies, Stephen Helm, Richard McIntosh, Jeff Stevenson, Ryan Williams, Larry Tooley, Dallas Bolin, Ryan St, Nathan Rex Madrid, Cameron Hendricks, Scandalous Official, Joe Motson, Let's Talk Resident Evil, Andrew Chase, Guy on the Couch, Chris Winchester, Antonio Reyes, Joe Otson, Dustin Stone, Lee Walker, Ryan Levson, John Hankis, Robert Bushaw, Troy Seal, Mark Horror Armenta, Jay Liberston, Nick Fowler, Mike Horgan, Emma Horgan, Arnorock, Patrick King, Oscar Brummett, Stacy Steinecke, Fernando Somoza, Patrick O'Brien, Dominique Zimmer, Ryan Sanders, Lara Snyder, Daniel Burt, Milwaukee Metal Sausage, Adam Boss. Adam Mecklenburg, 